Here, in the beginning, Paul is going to talk to the Romans here as we finish the 15th chapter today. And he's talking about several trips he's going to go on, something he looked forward to doing. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 15. We made it to verse 22 last time, so we'll start at 22. But he's talking about definite travel plans and specifically three destinations where he's going. And the first, he's going to take a, a trip from Corinth, where he is now writing the letter, all the way to Jerusalem which is about, a hundred people say, between 800 and 1,000 miles. And then he plans to go from there, from Jerusalem, to Rome on his way to Spain. Kind of a roundabout way to go, but that's about another 1,500 miles to go there. And then to get to Spain, probably seven 700 or so, depending how he goes, by sea or whatever. So he's got some big plans, some big trips he's planning on going, something he's looking forward to. And uh, so we'll get into that here. I think I'll just take it section by section today instead of reading to the end. I'll read verses, it'll start at verse 22 here today. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Uh, Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may joy, enjoy your company for a while. So this is Paul's first trip. He's talking to the Romans. He'd like to go visit them. They're in Rome. He's in Corinth. And he wants to make a trip up there and see them. And uh, again, we have to talk about why he's talking like this. In, in verse 22, he says, For this reason I have also been much hindered from coming to you. In other words, Paul had made a lot of trip planning. He wanted to come visit them. Uh, in Romans 1.13, we'll look at that in a minute again. He says, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often, I often plan to come to you, but if, uh, was hindered until now. So he's been making this plans for years to come and everything's been hindering him from coming. What hindered him? What hindered him? What was it that stopped him? Was it, was it Satan? <laughs> Did Satan hinder him from coming? Well, he says himself that he wanted to preach the gospel where Christ hadn't been named. And so he's busy where he was. And finally to come, he he says, I don't have any room left in these parts for the ministry that God has given me. And you think, well, was everybody saved then from Jerusalem up through all the way up to Illyricum, which is probably Albania today, up through Turkey, all those places he reached. Uh, but I guess you, you, we have to understand his ministry was kind of a, a pioneer missionary work, frontier work. And he wanted to go places that had no, not heard of Jesus and, and start a church. And you can tell his, uh, Timothy had a different ministry because he told Timothy, he said, do, Timothy, you do the work of an evangelist. Okay, You stay here and do the work of evangelism. But Paul's job was to plant churches outside in places where uh, Christ had not been named. And so he says, for this reason, I've been hindered from coming to you. I, I felt my job wasn't done yet. I had to go to places that are unevangelized field. And I told you that's where my dad and mom went first to Mexico, where they told them uh, they wouldn't come out alive if they went to that area. And as you saw here a few Sundays ago, they were here with us. So God protected them, didn't he? And brought them here and kept them alive, even though they were, dad was shot at and stuff. In those areas, but, and he has stories. Sometimes it'd be fun to sit down maybe at our house or something. Sometimes just have him tell stories to you of the happenings and how God used them in Mexico. I always enjoy hearing that. Uh, but he often came to them and, uh, and was hindered. He says, but now lo- no longer having place in these parts. Uh, and I have a, in verse 23, a great desire these many years to come to you. It's something that Paul had in for years. It wasn't just a, a wish, a whim uh, of doing something. Maybe you guys have planned something for many years. There's always something you always wanted to do or a place you always wanted to go. And this was one for Paul. And back in chapter one, I'll just read this. I kind of referred to it. If you go to chapter one and verse 11, you see the longings of Paul Hart, even at the beginning of the letter. He says, for I long to see you in verse uh, 11, 111. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. 
So Paul wasn't just going, I'm, I'm just here to teach you guys. Paul mutually says, by your faith, I want to be encouraged. When I go to see you guys, I want to be encouraged and both of us be encouraged by mutual faith of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. I have often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also as, as among the other Gentiles. So you see his desire again, that was for many years. And he says, whenever I go to Spain. So his plan was to go to Spain after he saw them in Rome. But just for a little while, just a short visit. Kind of, you know, I think of it as kind of a layover. <laughs> if you travel these days, if you ever travel on the airplane and you have several connections, sometimes you have a layover. Sometimes I've had an all-day layover. I remember in Barcelona, I had all-day layover when I was flying to somewhere else. You know what they did? They Somebody picked me from the... Reto, the drug rehab center, somebody picked me up and they planned meetings for that day in the at noon. And so they picked me up at the airport. They took me to one of the drug centers and at noon after, uh, before everybody had lunch together, we had sat down with probably 40, 50 people there, girls and guys together and we had a Bible study. They picked up and it was just a refreshing time to meet brothers and sisters, but they were, took time out of their day the busyness of it, nobody went right to work. They got out early to their different jobs that they had just to have a time of study. And uh, Paul said I, he wanted to be refreshed in their presence, to be encouraged by them. And I found that to be true in my own life. But here they, 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 he's just going to stay there a little while uh, when I journey to Spain. It's kind of a layover there, and I hope to see you, he says, and to be helped on my way by you. So Paul said, I want to go to you, but I also want to be helped by you on my way. Isn't it neat that you can help missionaries or somebody on their way? Now, Paul, often when he would go to a church or a church started, sometimes he'd take the people to help him be an escort with him. He's got quite an entourage sometimes with him, but he took Timothy from one church. And so maybe he's taking traveling companions with him. And he needs help in those areas. But he also needs help financially, too. How is he going to get to where he's going? And he says, I hope to be, you know, on my way to Spain, I hope to be helped by you. And uh, what else does he say here? If first I may enjoy your company for a while. A time of enjoying fellowship together. Uh, kind of an oasis, maybe. Uh, for a while, anyway. A place of refreshment. You know what I thought of after I was reading this this week? I said to me, myself, you know, I hope every missionary that comes here, don't we want to treat them like that? We have, would we determine as a church like that to, to help the missionaries on their way, whatever their needs might be, maybe even ask them what needs do you have? And when they come and visit us here, I hope it's not a place they regret coming and say, oh, I don't want to go to that church again. We remember how we were treated there last time, what they fed us. <laughs> Yeah. But Paul, Paul looked forward to it. He knew when he got there, he'd be refreshed in their presence for a little while. And he says, I want to be helped on my journey by you. And I said, could we determine to help missionaries that come here with needs and, and uh, just help them on the way and be an oasis for them? Some can come discouraged uh, and be an encouragement to them rather than a hindrance. But it takes time, doesn't it? We, we all have busy schedule. Things are going on. They sometimes come at an inconvenient time. But uh, some of you have helped with a meal. You brought a meal over to the house or, or invited the missionaries out for lunch or dinner and had a time together with them. Those are precious times. They're times of refreshment. And if Paul looked forward to it, I hope every missionary that comes here looks forward to I want to come to the Swanton Christian Church again and see the brothers there and be helped on my way by them and also to enjoy their company. Because we know, right? Sometimes <laughs> certain people leave the room, they lighten it up, brighten it up. But I hope that when uh, people come, we can treat them in a manner that's worthy, really, of the saints. And so Paul said, even at the end, you can skip to the very last verse of chapter 15, where he says that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. See, these times when missionaries come and stuff ought to be a time of refreshment. I, I enjoy listening to them preach. I enjoy listening to the to the stories Karen Hall were here. You guys remember Karen Hall and the story she told? Wasn't that interesting? Wasn't that fascinating? And, and we should look forward to hearing that 
uh, the testimonies from them. All right. Uh, I am too. When I go to Macedonia and I, I visit certain churches, certain brothers and sisters, I know I'm refreshed. I, I come back, even though it's been tiring, it's been refreshing at the same time. Uh, and notice in here he's making plans. See, there's nothing wrong with making plans, is there? Uh, Paul says he's making plans here uh, and to make them prayerfully. Um, but we have to remember that our plans are subject or we should be flexible with it because they can change. And God can change our plans. Um, and things don't work out maybe like we planned. Uh, uh, Proverbs 16, 9, if you guys want to memorize a good song or a good verse, his Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart plans his way. But the Lord directs his steps. A man plans his way. So we can have plans, but allow yourself flexibility enough for God to direct your steps. Because I don't know about you, but I've, I've had plans before and I felt the Lord's leading in certain ways, but it doesn't turn out at all like I planned. Do you ever have that happen? And so God says, let me direct your steps. It's fine to make plans, but uh, do it prayerfully and in the will of God. And so that's what Paul is doing. He's, He's thrown out there, I plan to come to you. I've been longing for years, and now I finally think I'm going to have some opportunity. And then let's go to verse 25. This is interesting. It's kind of the next section here, uh, Romans 15, 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. And it pleased them indeed. And they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, uh, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Here's the next little section. Paul says, I, I want to come to Rome. I want to see you guys. And that's my plan. Lord willing, I'll go there. But first, but now, so he's telling us now his present plans. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And you say, wait a minute, Paul. I, I thought you were a pioneer missionary. I thought you were trying to go to churches where, or go places where the gospel hadn't been heard, where people don't know about Jesus. And now you're talking about taking a trip to Jerusalem? Isn't that the Bible Belt? Isn't that where all the, uh, you know, Peter is and the apostles? And, uh, and now you're, it doesn't make sense, Paul. Why are you, after you say that, you're going to make a trip to, to Jerusalem? <laughs> Now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Again, that's another word for Christian. When the Bible talks about saints, it's talking about the Christians. Um, why go now? He's going to go south. It's about round trip, maybe between 1,600 and 2,000 mile trip. Yeah, we could do that in an airplane. Doug can do it in a very short time with the airplane. Get uh, uh, 2,000 miles under a belt. And we say, no big deal, 2,000 miles. But hey, think about these days. That, that took a long time. I took a long time. And uh, the dangers that are in the roads, the dangers. Uh, and now why is he going there? And verse 26 says, It pleased those in Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contribution to the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. There were some poor people in Jerusalem, the Christians, and they were having a rough time. And people from the churches in Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia Minor as well, though he didn't mention them, they took a big collection. And Paul was on his way to Jerusalem to give it. And he called this a ministry. He said, I'm going to minister to the saints there. This is, I have a job yet to do. I'm going to go to Rome on my way to Spain, but first I have a job I have to do. I'm going to go there. They've taken a collection um, <laughs> among the poor there. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, turn with me if you want. Keep your finger there, but go to Acts chapter 11. I think this might be stemming. How, how, why were there poor in Jerusalem at this time? And this may give us a hint. Chapter 11, Acts 11 and verse 27. And in these days, uh, days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus 
stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it by the elders, uh, by the elders, by the hands of Paul, or Barnabas, and Saul. So it might have been from this same famine. I'm not exactly sure. As Josephus writes about it and said that they were going to Egypt for food, uh, bringing because of the famine was so severe and so on. But isn't it neat that God had a prophet there that by the Spirit of God told the people, warn them ahead of time, hey, there's going to be a famine. And uh, people prepared for it. And they gave, and I don't know if this is the result still of the same famine, but probably something similar to that was happening at that time. And so Paul begins to take a collection from all the churches where he traveled, the Gentile churches, to take this collection and offer it to them. Boy, oh boy, wouldn't that have been some kind of a trip? Uh, I don't know what saddlebags or what do you put it in? The money and the silver and the gold or whatever, however you're collecting. It's not like, you know, when you show up in an armored truck, <laughs> uh, you're traveling on uh, by foot and maybe donkey or something and load them up and quite an entourage. You, I suppose you, it's not something you go around announcing, you know, we got a lot of money in our bags here. <laughs> Taking a collection to Jerusalem, that word gets out and be mobs on the way waiting to steal from you. But, uh, uh, Paul, why? Well, again, let's get back to why Paul is doing this. And I think it was because when Paul went to see the elders at Jerusalem, Paul didn't go very often to Jerusalem, but when he did, he was explaining to his to the disciples or to the apostles his ministry to the Gentiles, and they gave him the right hand of fellowship. They said, "We agree with you, Paul. You're you're doing what God has called you to do, and it's right in line." with the teachings of the scripture and so on. But then they, they just said one thing, Paul, uh, keep, remember the poor, remember the poor. And Paul says, the very thing I was eager to do, eager to do. Now you can kind of understand why, why Paul was willing to make this long trip. He said, he'd remembered that they'd said that. They were poor in Jerusalem. And Paul said, I'm eager to do that. How, how many of you are eager to help the poor? Kind of, I, I lately have been more reluctant. I guess I've been lied to so much by people saying they need money for this and that. And that it kind of makes me a little bit reluctant. Yet, yet you hear Paul's heart. He says, the very thing I was eager to do, remember the poor, to help them out. And so he takes this trip. He wanted to be there. He wanted to help them. And so he makes this long trip. And here, twice in this passage, and back in uh, Romans 15, in verse 27 and, let's see here, and 26. 26, it says, For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution. How many of you are that way? Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. And we take up an offering here in church. Too, how many of us do it cheerfully? It says it pleased them to do this. And then in verse 27, the one we're on now, it pleased them indeed. He repeats it. He makes it as though it's a, something worth repeating. It pleased them from Macedonia and Achaia, and it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. They had an obligation to do it as well. Um, let me just read in uh, 2 Corinthians. Just keep your finger there again. Uh, I just want to show you what their reaction to it was when they heard of a need in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That's why Paul in, in writes to the Corinthians. He's taken a collection from them as well. Uh, he spends two chapters almost talking about giving here. But I want to read the first few verses of chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now Paul's in, uh, telling them about the Macedonian churches. He said that in great trial of affliction... Uh, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. <laughs> it's quite a statement. They, they had great affliction. Uh, 
but uh, the uh, let me read it again. That in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear them witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we may that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They they begged, hey, we want a part of this. We heard you're taking a collection. We want a part of this. And it says out of their deep poverty, they gave and they did it with joy. And they did it. It's the poor giving to the poor. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> he takes a collection from the poor in Macedonia and they wanted, let Paul, Paul, I want to, I want to be involved in this. Let, we don't have much, but here we're going to give what we can. And they gave it and they gave joyfully. And so that's why I think Paul says it pleased them to give. And do you find it that way too when you can meet a need or something that God touches your heart? Get, you know, you've got to give this. Oh, but I want to save this money to go to a baseball game. Well, maybe it'd do a lot better uh, in something like this. Isn't it neat how when God touches our hearts, it touches our wallets too? It affects our money purses that we would do things we never did before and never dreamed of doing. And yet when we do it, we can do it with pleasure. For God, what does Paul say? God loves a cheerful giver. Don't, don't give out of grudgingly. Oh, I have to do this. <laughs> but give joyfully. Isn't that neat that we, we, we're, we're pretty blessed here in our country. We can give a lot. We think we're poor. Even our poorest are pretty well off. And so he just re reminds us again, they did it that please, they did it with pleasure that they could take part in this. And he says, and he adds this one way, they did it with pleasure, but it was also their duty to do. They had an obligation to do it. They owe it to them. And how does he say it? Uh, he says it this way. It's kind of a strange way, but we've been reading through Romans, so it should make sense to us. He says, for if the Gentiles have been partakers of, the, of their spiritual things, the Jewish spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Remember, it's chapter 11 of Romans all over again. The Jews, Gentile, because of their fall, it brought riches to the Gentiles. The olive, we've been grafted in, wild olive branches, Gentiles, grafted into, into one body, but the, the, the cultivated olive branch, the Jews. And he told us not to look down on the Jews because of that. And he told the Jews also to, you know, that we're partakers of it and so on. It's one church. Aren't you glad it's not? the Gentile church and then the Jewish church, two different churches. What Paul is trying to do and make people understand in his day too that God has torn down that wall between them. He brought Jews and Gentiles to be one body. There's only one body. He's bringing them together. And so he says, listen, if we've benefited by them in spiritual in spiritual ways, we should also help them. And that's Paul's issue. That's why we're taking largely Gentile offering here all the way to Jerusalem to offer it to these Jewish Christians there that were in need. And so that's kind of what's happening here. And, uh, and also, it says here in Galatians 6, 6, he says, let him who taught the word share in all good things with, them who teach, with him who teaches. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. You know, that's why if somebody... Blesses your heart if a missionary comes and speaks here or something, and your your God has ministered through that person to you. Feel free to give them a, a an offer. The church usually does. We do as uh, we usually write them a check. But if you feel, you know, I think you could do it as well and add to it. That's a great thing, isn't it? If they, if they've ministered to you in some spiritual way and you've been benefited by it, why not materially help them out as well financially? And. Uh, well, it's kind of neat the way it works out here. Uh, we, we both come away blessed and we owe it to them. In a sense, it's an obligation, but it's uh, to be done also with cheerfulness and with, with pleasure. And then he says in verse 28, Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. So there's his travel plans again. And it, it's, it, he calls it fruit here. When I've sealed to you this fruit, it's, it's more than just money. Coming with it is the love and concern for Gentile believers, for the Jewish uh, Christian, the Jewish brothers and sisters. 
that are concerned and want to help out in their time of need. And then let's go to verse uh, 29. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. Again, his plans is just to come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And then verse 30. Now here's kind of another separation, the third theme maybe in this chapter, and it's one of prayer. He says, now I beg you, brothers, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. It's interesting here how Paul recognizes his need for intercessory prayers and support. See that? I love reading statements like this because it encourages me in prayer too. Did you know, and kids, and you pray for a missionary or something, you're entering into that ministry that they have. It might be in New Guinea. It might be in China. You're praying. You're actually helping, being a part of it. And so he says, I beg you. He's asking. He's never been to Rome as far as we know. And he, he's asking these people in the church, hey, pray for me. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, and through the love of the Spirit. I think in, in Romans 5, 5, it said that he shed abroad the love of God in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's really hard to pray for somebody or help somebody unless you love them, right? Why do we pray for lost people? We love them. We want to see them saved. And Paul, it, here's another brother in Christ, and he's asking for prayer. And we join in on that. And he calls it here that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Paul's asking prayer for himself, but he's saying, listen, brothers and sisters, will you, will you wrestle in prayer for me? Will you strive? You see, prayer's not always that simple. Why? Because we fight against spiritual forces. We fight against Satan. We fight against uh, spirit, uh, principalities, powers, all the things that are written in Ephesians. And so, my goodness, it, it's not just we say a prayer and that's it, you know, and that's the end of it. Well, we see we join in in a battle, in a battle for, for souls. For Paul has specific things in mind he's going to ask for, but it's a, it's a battle. There's a time of rest and there's a time of battle. And Paul brings up that part, the battle part. Um, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. In verse 31, he tells what it is. That I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. And the word actually is to the disobedient to the disobedient in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Yeah, basically two things. Uh, I'm going to Jerusalem. You, I've already told you my plans, but friend, will you strive and pray for me? Will you get behind me? Not just when I'm with you. Will you get behind me right now and begin to pray? Why did Paul ask for that if he didn't think it would help? So I'm encouraging some of you maybe never asked for prayer. Ask for prayer. Ask a brother or sister to pray. Uh, we all have needs. And, and get behind and say, hey, I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that. Will you get behind and pray, me and pray for me? I need prayer. And join in in, the, in in this thing and become part of lightening a burden for somebody else. And, and multiplying really the blessings that come through. it. That I might be delivered though from those who, in Judea, who are uh, who do not believe, and that my service for the Jerusalem saints there might be acceptable to them. Uh, you see, a lot of the Jews in Jerusalem had rejected the gospel. They didn't like what Paul was saying, and uh, they were prepared to attack Paul if he comes back again. <laughs> Paul was aware of that, that making a trip to Jerusalem would be a little bit on the dangerous side for him. And so he wanted the Christians to get behind him and pray for deliverance so that he could complete this ministry that he'd had given by God. I want to take this offering. I want to take this gift to the church here. God has given me this ministry to do first. I plan to do it. So would you pray for me to do it? And that I'd be delivered. Um, and then verse 32, that I might come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Um. Keep your finger again there in Romans chapter one. Look at how Paul prayed for these people. He's asking them for prayer, but Paul often prayed for them. In chapter one and verse nine and 10. For God is my witness whom I serve with the spirit of the gospel of his son, 
that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Notice he says in the will of God. Again, I have these plans, but I, I, in the will of God that I'll come to you. In the will of God to come to you. And it reminds me just of what James says. If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. And so always keeping God's will up foremost. Make plans, that's fine. Let's say if the Lord wills. And again, the purpose of prayer isn't so that we get our wishes met, our, our wills be done on, on earth. <laughs> uh, the purpose is to align ourselves in prayer. And I think Dave talked about it today, Dave Fox, and he, he talked about you know, the trials that come our way. God, deliver me. Paul's asking for deliverance. I didn't come quite like he thought. It came much different way, but the purpose in prayer is to align ourselves also with the will of God. And again, remember that uh, Proverbs 16, 9, man's heart plans his way, but the Lord uh, directs his step. So be flexible, be flexible in, in your planning. Because uh, I know with me sometimes when things don't work out, I get a little upset <laughs> when my plans don't work out the way I thought they should. And then you really realize, wait a minute, who am I, sir? I'm submitted to the will of God. I want his will to be done. So what happened to Paul's requests? It seems to be that the, the gift was accepted. Uh, the gift that he had brought to, uh, from the Gentiles. Because he could have said, you know, we don't want any part with those Gentiles. They called them dogs earlier, you know. <laughs> but God had changed their hearts. And apparently it was acceptable. But the, the second thing is, was Paul, de was Paul delivered? Uh, was this prayer really answered? Uh, he was delivered from death. I'd count that a plus. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Uh, Paul says, pray for me that I be delivered. I believe these people began to pray and God heard them. And he was, because he faced death. Between the time he asked them in Corinth to pray, I'm going to read just a few things that happened to him. And you're going to be amazed. He did come to Jerusalem. And Agabus, I don't know if it was the same prophet, said, hey, Paul, if you're going to, he takes Paul's belt off and ties his hands with it. He said, Paul, whoever the owner of this belt is, they're going to tie you up when you get to Jerusalem. And Paul says, I'm willing to lay down my life if need be. But I'm going. And he goes to Jerusalem. And sure enough, he isn't there very long and he's arrested. First of all, the, tri the crowd was trying to kill him. They're trying to kill him. So you think it helped? They, they didn't succeed the first time. The soldiers came in and, and rescued him. And then Paul asked to speak to them. Loud, you know, and, and, and the Roman... Uh, whoever was the tribune was in charge. He just said, go ahead. So Paul began to speak and he shared his whole te testimony to the people. And he thought it was great. Everything was fine until he mentioned uh, that God sent him to the Gentiles. And when he said that, the mob just got in an uproar and he had to <laughs> take Paul out of that violent crowd again. And then the third time before the tribune, he he was getting upset or getting in trouble. Let's let's read that if we could in Acts chapter 23, and I'm almost done. Acts 3, 23. His plans weren't going quite like we thought, huh? Uh, maybe like it should. Uh, Acts 23, and I'm going to start at verse 10. You'll notice in the middle verse something very good is sandwiched between this. So now, now when there arose, a, uh, there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. <laughs> this third time they tried to rip Paul apart and kill him. And uh, they feared that he was going to rip him to pieces. Aren't you glad the Romans were praying? They were striving together in prayer for him. God deliver him. I wonder if God touched some people's hearts in Rome at that very moment that Paul was giving his testimony. God does that sometimes, does he not? Maybe you've experienced it. God lays something hard upon your heart and you just begin to pray. And then later on you found out that the people you prayed for were in desperate trouble. At that moment, you, God gave you a sense that something was happening. And Paul was about to be ripped to pieces. 
And he steps in and, and rescues him. And then now verse 11, a, somewhat of a comfort here. It says, but the, the following night, the Lord stood by him. They've read something like that today too. The Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul. That day, I bet Paul needed to hear that, don't you think? I think Paul needed to hear that. I mean, he's almost killed. And then that night, God stands by him and says, be of good cheer, Paul. Oh, yeah, I need a little bit of cheering up here. It'll be of good cheer. For as you have testified of, for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in at Rome. So here God tells him, God tells me, he says, Paul, I need you in Rome. You're going to go to Rome. You're just not going the way you thought you were going. <laughs> After you delivered this offering here, and we're going to turn around, they almost killed you. But Paul, be of good cheer. You're not going to die. You're going to go to, you're going to testify of me in Rome. And then look at verse 12. Just after that, and when it was day, day had come, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. <laughs> They're not going to do it. They're not going to be able to. And you know the story if you read it. Then the sandwich between two death threats on Paul is of comforting words. Cheer, be of good cheer. You have to testify of me at Rome. And so he, he got that in mind. And was that the end? After that failed attempt to take his life? That wasn't the end. They had a long journey ahead in a shipwreck. They had a shipwreck. And in that shipwreck, he could have lost his life. And if that wasn't enough, he gets on, gets on the ground and is taking a bundle of, of sticks to throw in the fire. And he did. And a viper latches onto him and bites him. And the people were waiting for Paul to die. You couldn't kill Paul, isn't that great? had <laughs> uh, yeah, more than nine lives. You couldn't kill him. Why? Because God said he would have to testify. Him. But it didn't spare him, did it? The shipwreck. That's what Dave was talking about today. God deliver me. He did deliver Paul from death, but not from arrest and not from the trials he faced and not from what seemed like certain death. And yet God brought Paul to Rome. But you know, he spent two years in prison there first before anything moved. And it was some most figure. It took about three years for Paul to get to Rome. It was a long time. Paul made these plans, but can you see this? He, he trusted God with him. By the will of God, I'll come to you and be refreshed in your presence and so on. But pray for me. Pray for me. See how important prayer is, brothers and sisters. We need to pray for one another. Strive together in prayer. But before the striving before the, the, the refreshing time together in their presence with Paul came the time of striving and battle and prayer. And then finally that day stood when Paul was in Rome and how God used him in different ways there. Um, but striving together. And let's strive for one another. I know Noreen was very sick this week and had surgery as well. and She testified of uh, extreme pain, but how God, in the moment of her desperation, she just screamed out to God, really, it seemed like, that God answered right then and gave her help in certain things, at least three occasions that she counted to me. And uh, just asking for prayer, pray for me. And it's a striving. Uh, she feared that she would die there, you know, too. So she's had that before. But see how important prayer, praying for one another, too, striving together uh, and battling. But then he ends up the last verse by saying, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I love that the way he says it, the God of peace. He had a benediction in chapter 15. He's had two of them. I just want to look at them real quick, just a refresher for you. Now may the, in verse 5, Now may the God of patience and comfort. And may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded. He's the God of patience. He's the God of comfort. And then in verse 13, 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he ends here by bringing Jews and Gentiles together. And he says, listen, may the God of peace. He's a source of our peace. If we want peace in here as a fellowship, as a group of believers, <laughs> it, the source is in Jesus the God of hope, the God of peace be with you all.
And so let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. I've learned some things out of here this passage this week, and I sure don't want a missionary to come here, Lord, that won't be refreshed in our presence. I pray that we'd be able to bless them, that we would be able to be a church that helps people on their on their way. Individuals who, when we've been ministered spiritually by someone, that we turn around there and bless them then in material ways. Lord Jesus, thank you. We owe it to them. And so I just pray you would help us here and also help us, Lord, to strive in prayer for one another, to see you answered prayer, that you get so much praise, Lord, when more people know about it, more people can give thanks as well, and more people can see your hand at work. And so help us to be a people that strives together in prayer for one another. And Lord, we just pray for victories this week in our own lives and the needs that the church might have today. And so we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather. And I pray that something here we've shared, Lord, and that in all of our planning as well, Lord Jesus, that you would direct our steps. Direct us, guide us, guide these young people, Lord, in their plans and their schooling and, and where they should go next and everything. May it be submitted. It may not be at all like we imagine it. Their life may not turn out at all like we imagined it to be. But Lord Jesus, we thank you that submitted to your will. We want to see your purposes accomplished. And that's what we want to be involved in. The things of eternity that last forever. Something that goes beyond the grave into eternity. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I close with the same benediction Paul did. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. <laughs>